Okay, so guys, welcome to another web seminar. Sorry for the all the technical problems. So today is a pleasure to have Giorgio um, with us to talk about uh, some of the hydrodynamic stuff of PGP. So Giorgio starts his career actually very very young under the other undergraduate uh, uh, degree. He's working already in part of the namely in strangeness and housing. Yeah. So this was in 1997 during his physics degree in Oxford University, and then the master in 2000 in Birmingham, and then finally mm -hmm. after Europe, Europe went to Arizona University uh, to do the PhD, where he started to work more on thermal result and statistical hydrogenization model. Since then he moved uh, first to Canada, to Germany, and afterwards at New York in New York as a postdoc. And the currently is an associate professor in the cosmic ray department at the Unicamp University. Today, we will talk about the relativistic um, QCD, or QGP hydrodynamics, in particular the hidden gauge symmetry of uh, relativistic consecutive hydrodynamics. So, please, George, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, and thank you very much to Lilian and Guilherme for organizing this. And thank you, all of you guys, for listening. I mean, it's it's the Ponte, so <laughs> I'm taking you away from, from a potential holiday, and I hope it will make it worth your while. Um, it's very treated as very informal also because you guys are sort of, I know that most of you do not work on, on this stuff, and these ideas are probably controversial. If you have any question, do not interrupt, do not hesitate to interrupt. I mean, this talk is sort of, uh, if I don't go through all the slides because I answer questions, it's better if I go through all the slides and, you know, no one understands anything. So let's stop. It's not, yeah. It's just because I didn't know. Oh, yeah? No. Yes. No? Okay, can you try now? Yeah. 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 Um, first of all, I'm going to argue that sort of what statistical, what relativistic hydrodynamics isn't really derived in a way that is consistent with the experimental data. And I'm going to and I'm going to talk about it, namely there is a fundamental issue between how we think of hydrodynamics and the experimental observation that small systems seem to behave hydrodynamically. I'm going to perhaps uh, introduce an alternative way of that might be used to think of hydrodynamics. And I'm going to suggest that this is connected to a possible reason as to how come systems of just 20 particles seem to behave close to ideal fluids. So, I mean, we start with sort of the famous stuff. Um, the heavy ion program was made to look for poor gluon plasma in deconfinement. We still, uh, we're still looking for it in some sense. I mean, no one really knows, no one really has a uh, signature that can be conclusively um, thought of as liberation of quark degrees of freedom. But we found other interesting stuff such as whatever is, heavy ion produced in these heavy ion collisions seems to behave as a perfect liquid, uh, which basically means that the viscosity compared to the entropy density and the two have the same units, so you can parameterize them in terms of the two, is a very small number. And this was, this is in all the newspapers, there was even a coffee cup about it. And this has, uh, in practice, what people measure, I mean, first of all, sort of experimentally, this was a very famous result, so it's worth giving a few details about it. From the experimental point of view, what happens is that the nucleus collision here, one nucleus goes this the way, the other nucleus goes this way, and it's an off-central collision, so the hot region, where if you want is the quark gluon plasma, looks like an ellipse, 
if this ellipse was made of weakly interacting particles like uh, you know asymptotic freedom and such suggests, then who cares what the shape is? The particles just fly out in all directions. However, um, if the interactions between the particles is very strong, you can think of sort of pressure gradients being formed. There is a gradients here, and these gradients depend on the azimuthal coordinate. So this is sort of, you know, that the nuclei are like this, and the, the, whole, the axis of the ellipse is like this. And there is more pressure gradient this way than this way, and therefore there is more flow this way, and the bubble of hot liquid, if you want, will start becoming rounder. From the experimental point of view, this is related to an observable which experimentalists sort of find relatively simple to measure, which is simply, you take the spectrum of particles and you take a Fourier transform with respect to the phi component. Um, to do this, of course, you need a phase, you need a phase, you need a zero. And this zero um, is the, physically it should be the reaction plane. So physically it should be the, it should be the, the zero should simply be the perpendicular to the line that connects the centers of the nuclei. So the centers of the nuclei are vertical and therefore in this ellipse the reaction plane is horizontal. Um, in some experiments one can measure this. However, you can also do, you, 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 you can do even better because the problem is that Conservation of momentum gives you resonance correlations, right? If you have a particle going up, you have another particle going down. Um, hydrodynamics is obviously more than this, but one thing that you can do is you study, you can study multi-particle correlations in the azimuthal angle, simply complicated correlations functions in the azimuthal angle. And if you do this, you find that this gradient is present in every single correlator. So this is not conservation of momentum. Um, this is a collective effect. The system is the system is behaving as a collective. So if you if you try to fit the if you try to fit this, um, the, ah, okay, good. If you try to fit this, you will see that ideal hydrodynamics. I mean, this is very slow. Ah, here. In between these two guys is sort of either a viscous fluid or, you know, you can think of this as kinetic theory, which is a fancy name for billiard ball jumping off each other. So in both of these cases, the, if the mean free path is comparable to the size, um, then the viscosity sort of destroys these pressure gradients. And then you go to the free particle limit where the particle trajectories are as isotropic with respect to the shape. The azimuthal anisotropy is so big that the azimuthal anisotropy is so big that ideal fluids fit. And if you try to put in a viscosity, then the, vis the very small viscosity will be enough to quench the, the anisotropy. Um, so this was, as I said, this was a result that had a lot of impact. In many areas, the popular press talked about it. And within physics, it kind of reignited the development of relativistic hydrodynamics, which was sort of built up in the 70s, but people stopped worrying about this because who cares about relativistic fluids? Well, now we care, so we started to rederive it, if you want. So what is relativistic hydrodynamics? Um, the conventional with some is that it's an effective theory built around conserved currents and isotropy. So for example, you have the conservation of the energy momentum tensor, and then you have mostly equilibration. So you can divide the energy momentum tensor into an equilibrium part and the relaxational part. Then the equilibrium part is purely diagonal. The equilibrium part is purely diagonal. And in this case, and if you also put in the equation of state, you get five equations with five unknowns. So if you ever, there are no linear equations, so you generally need computers to solve them, but the computer and a clever program forwarding the code can solve this from any set of initial conditions. The non-equilibrium part can be decomposed into the gradients of the equilibrium part times coefficients, which can be calculated by 
quantum, in principle, I mean, in practice, this calculation is actually very, very difficult in perturbation theory, for example. But in principle, it can be calculated from equilibrium using from equilibrium using correl equilibrium thermal field theory correlators. So you have the series, it's just like perturbation theory basically, except it's more like effective theory because the small parameter is this microscopic scale times the gradient, what's usually known as the constant. So um, what is the problem with this? Um, nothing really except possibly. First of all, the way that fluctuations are treated, in a sense, this is a deterministic theory because you're using conservation laws to evolve the system forward. These guys are correlators, but correlators are statistical things. And of course, you cal when you calculate them in quantum field theory, they are related to statistical formulas, but here they're not. Here they are series expansions of the average expectation values of T million, if you want to, in a certain way. So their fluctuations play no role. It's also a little bit bad that you need a top-down theory to calculate the equation of state and the viscosities. I mean, in a sense that's, you know, well, obviously you do, because hydrodynamics is a macroscopic theory. And the bottom line is that we want to make a connection with QCD thermodynamics. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. However, if we're going to develop a, quant a universal theory, a universe, fluids seem to be universal things. And in these approaches, typically the exact details of the field of the effective expansion depends strongly on the effective theory being used. Can, and the question is, can we say something about hydrodynamics, which is as universal as what we say about statistical mechanics, you know, with ergodicity and equilibrium and stuff like that? And what is the role really of fluctuations? Um, up until the LHC was turned on, all of these things were basically you could be forgiven for that these things are sort of grumbling. I mean, you know, the, uh, yeah, academic importance, but who cares? I mean, you know, we're describing, we're describing experimental data. Who cares about these things? I mean, you know, we're phenomenologists. The problem is that the LHC turned on. And between the fact that you had higher mean multiplicity and the fact that you had, you know, more advanced detectors, there's a more experience of our experimental colleagues in doing analysis, they managed to start applying these correlation methods that I was talking about to not just to AA systems, but to PP and PA systems. I mean, for PP, you don't have a reaction. In PA, you don't have a reaction plane. I mean, you do, but you cannot distinguish it experimentally because the hot region is a proton size. But correlations, you can still do if your detector is sort of good enough and the LHC detector certainly were. And then came sort of a surprise that actually, um, if you look at higher and higher correlators, if you actually look at two particle correlators, then AA is bigger, but this is basically jet physics. I mean, it's conservation of momentum and two jets coming out with lots of particles. If you start looking at more and more particle correlations, you get a plateau where you get collective flow. But the problem is that this plateau is basically the same for PP, PA, and AA. So the collectivity systems of proton, proton, systems of proton, proton with 20 particles are as collective as heavy iron collisions with 3000 particles and you know 10 femtometers in size. Well, proton is you know, the deeply the QCD, lambda QCD. And yet the fluid behavior isn't exclusive for large systems. It can also be seen in smaller systems with few particles. So there is in a theory without fluctuations and only based on conservation laws, this is very weird. Because as I said, there is this Knudsen number and people thought, well, the Knudsen number has to have something to do with the QCD scale because this is the only scale that appears there. And yet, it seems to play no role because it seems to play no role because systems with proton proton size and systems with heavy ion size behave the same way. Numerically, they're not the same, but the geometry, the azimuthal initial geometry is also not the same. So you don't expect exact numerical 
the same, but the scaling of it. So, um, if you ask, if you ask most people, um, the answer to this is something which is usually called hydrodynamic attractors, hydrodynamization, fake equilibration, and so on and so forth. And what it basically means is, remember I talked about this universality. Um, usually people think of hydrodynamics as a limit of, in our field, it's two fields. It's the Boltzmann equation, which is essentially billiard balls sequentially scattering off each other, and string theory, and ADS-CFT, where you get the strongly coupled, where you get these strongly coupled estimates. So you go to the, you go to the microscopic theory, be it the Boltzmann equation or ADS-CFT, you go to a system with enormous, with a lot of symmetry, typically like zero plus one dimensional, so perfect. Forget anisotropy, it's a perfectly isotropic system. You solve it and you discover that even though the Knudsen number, like if you take the microscopic parameter over the macroscopic parameter, you get a number much bigger than one because early times typically gradients are huge. Um, the system starts looking like an ideal fluid a lot sooner than it should. So it seems that with hydrodynamics, yes, it's an ex Taylor expansion around the Knudsen number, but you can Taylor expand around the Knudsen number of 100, and the Taylor expansion will still work. And this is sort of for whatever, for whatever reason. This is sort of the path that most of our field got, went, went into it, and you actually have these arguments which also use some sophisticated mathematics like strand series which show that yeah i mean there are good reasons for this to work at least and this is my problem with this i mean i do not want to knock this stuff too much but i don't believe this and i don't believe this because they are to me they're kind of asking the wrong question because they are answering the wrong question because the question uh, is, hello uh, hi uh, Rajya, can i ask a question sure yeah, so in this plot, uh, what is the meaning of uh, PL by epsilon uh, going oh. negative? Yeah, in this plot, it's the, in this plot, it's basically the longitudinal pressure. So this is Bjorken expansion. It's pressure in the Z direction divided by energy. And what they're doing is they're looking at um, if this pressure converges into what the equation of state gives you. Okay. Yeah, but, and they yeah. find that basically, yeah, in the beginning it oscillates a lot, but then you get this attractor, and this attractor happens to coincide with what the equation of state gives you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I chose a plot. I chose a plot at random, but this is all when they plot convergence to hydrodynamics behavior. They usually do this. Sometimes they do like the difference between transverse and longitudinal pressure, between time component of pressure and longitudinal pressure, because it's a zero plus one system. Uh, sometimes they look at energy density divided by what the equation of state or temperature scaling gives you, but this is usually what they do. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole point of these things is assuming that the microscopic theory works and checking the gradient expansion. The problem is that these gradients don't really exist. These gradients are event by event averages. Um, uh, these gradients are event by event averages and every event has 20 particles. The question to ask isn't why does hydrodynamics work with such large gradients? The question to ask is why does hydrodynamics work with such few particles? Because the point is that in a sense, hydrodynamics is an effective theory around local thermalization. Thermalization isn't the equilibrium state is certain. Thermalization is all microstates are likely. You know, back to, back to basics here. And if the number of particles is very small, even if high equilibration is perfect and viscosity is zero and grid, the size of gradients is irrelevant because the mean free path is zero, because why not? I mean, you know, could be something fundamental in quantum mechanics. Even then, fluctuations cannot be neglected. They cannot be neglected. 
And this is something that we don't even know how to calculate, but certainly their effect appears to be zero because, you know, um, in, this, in this regime, maybe ideal hydrodynamics works and we have to justify why, but the Boltzmann equation or it cannot work because there is no molecular chaos. The second law of thermodynamics perhaps works on average, but certainly doesn't work in every case. And we really need to understand the version of hydrodynamics in this regime. Um, people usually thought, and by people, I very much include me, that, well, fluctuations are random things. Thermalization is, uh, thermalization is, you know, it's this deterministic thing. So perhaps these fluctuations, you know, a limit of this car, the mean free path has to be smaller than the density of degrees of freedom and the viscosity has to be bigger than uh, something that you get from the density of degrees of freedom. The thing is that experimental data says exactly the opposite. Thermal hydrodynamic behavior is uh, independent of the size. So if we want to explain experimental data, we have to find out a way that fluctuations either help you thermalize or at least don't spoil the thermalization. And this is strange. I mean, I've, I do not know anything like this in the literature. Also because usually in usually hydrodynamics, I mean, there are mathematicians who work on hydrodynamics. There are mathematicians who work on hydrodynamics and connecting hydrodynamics to statistical mechanics is actually kind of the related to the millennium problem in maths of finding eternal solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations. And some of the things, I mean, I tried talking to mathematicians, some of the things they came out with is crazy. Like you have this thing called weak solutions, which are basically coarse grained. I mean, I'm being sloppy with the notation. I'm not a mathematician, but they're basically coarse grained solutions. And if you find certain coarse graining functions, you even have things called wild and nightmare solutions, um, which are basically solutions where you start with a hydrostatic limit, you end with a hydrostatic limit, and you have a turbulent period in the middle. This is ridiculous. I mean, you know, break the second law of thermodynamics, but it kind of suggests um, if you are a formal mathematician doing partial differential equations, these are well-defined solutions, and it kind of suggests that these two guys don't necessarily, there is no consistent way of going one into the other. Um, usually we do not think of hydrodynamics this way. Usually if you ask the average heavy ion physicist, they, um, uh, yeah, they think of transport. They think of the Boltzmann. Um, they think of the Boltzmann equation. And here you have its paradoxes of its own. For example, let's take the simplest Boltzmann equation that we find. And this is sort of a favorite of these hydrodynamization people. Let's take the simplest Boltzmann equation that we find, which is, you know, P mu over M delta mu F equals zero, free streaming, uh, free streaming. So how do you solve free streaming? Well, we know how to solve free streaming. We just propagate the, this is classic, this is not quantum, this is classical. We can also solve quantum by the way, but in the classical limit, this is like Galileo's, you know, the, the first law of Galileo in motion. You take, the, um, you take the distribution function and you propagate. The problem is that, and this is a solution. The problem is that this is not the only solution because People who study transport will point out that um, this is also the Euler equation as well. In a sense that if you have perfect detailed balance, the integral, if you have interactions, here you have the usual collision equation. Here you have the usual collision equation, but if you have perfect equilibrium, here you have zero. And indeed, if you take a system and you start it in equilibrium with a flow vector, which is a killing vector, with a flow vector that satisfies a killing equation, you can show very easily that this equation is satisfied. 
In other words, you have perfect hydrodynamics with free stream. When I saw this a few years ago, I mean, I had this screaming argument with the guy who showed it to me because this is obviously absurd. And he was telling me, but this is mathematically correct. And I was saying, I don't care, this is ridiculous. Um, I don't care if it's correct mathematically, and this is ridiculous. Um, because, for example, you can put boundary conditions where the fluid spins around, and the fluid will spin around. Kelvin's theorem. You have vortices which go forever. But billiard balls that do not interact cannot produce vortices. Okay? They're not. <laughs> they're not accelerating, so how can they spin around? I mean, maybe they. Inter I mean, they interact with the walls. But again, if you uh, if you take a billiard ball and make it bounce around walls, you will never get a curved vortex, right? So I restarted. I mean, this is this sound. This is complicated. I mean, there are people who do this stuff for a living who didn't think about it seriously, and the answer is that there is a that there is a hidden assumption we made that there isn't not just an infinity, but a countable. The ensemble averaging basically means that there is an uncountable infinity of particles here. So yeah, if you have an uncountable infinity of billiard balls, all of them going in straight lines, if you average this together, you will get curves and you will get vortices, no problem, even though every particle is moving in a straight line. However, um, if you try to make sub-events of 10 particles, or 100 particles, or 1,000 particles, or a million particles, you will never see particles going around in a vortex. Um, you will only see straight lines. It's only when you make an infinity of particles and put them together that you will see curves, that you will see curves. So yes, this is a solution, but this is a solution that takes advantage of the infinity of events. And every sub-event that you have Will be um, will be completely different. Now, both thermal fluctuations and Boltzmann fluctuations is a way to divide up this guy here into sub-events of finite number of particles. Think of this as frequentist probability different worlds or you know the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics if you want this equation here is the aggregate this equation here is the aggregate of worlds and both thermal fluctuations and both thermal fluctuations and the Boltzmann equation mix these worlds together and when you are in the ideal hydrodynamic limit then in every world you have hydrodynamic motion and when you are close to the free streaming limit, um, the average is hydrodynamic motion, but every world is different. And in this sense, it's a solution and it's a non-physical solution. So the moral of the story is um, experimental data seems to favor closer to the fact that we're dealing with cumulants of many particles really means that in every event, um, the things are moving in the, hydrodynamic like trajectory and we need to find a way to understand we need to find a way to mix worlds in the transport language in a way that incorporates thermal fluctuations and mean free path on the same context and this sort of is very different from the Boltzmann equation because the Boltzmann equation has its hidden assumptions the molecular chaos issue the, the molecular chaos issue and the ensemble averaging essentially mean that the number of particles is infinite from the beginning. And this is exactly the assumption we want to relax. Um, and this is an assumption that we definitely were, uh, that, that, that we want to relax. By the way, I mean, sort of the biggest expert on this on the mathematics side is Cedric Villani, and I re really recommend, especially if you studied transport theory as a physicist, I really recommend this seminar on YouTube because he really takes he really takes this topic and explains it in a way that is orthogonal to what physicists, physicists have done. I mean, for example, the interesting, for example, he introduces the Boltzmann scattering term as a kind of ultraviolet completion of loss of gradients. I mean, this is, it makes sense. It's, it's very... Okay, I mean, this was a long introduction because as I said, I was giving a pedagogical seminar where I consider to be what I proud of where I consider what the problems are. I still have half an hour, right? Basically. Um, I, yeah. So let me, 
let me let me explain sort of in in principle where we're going. It's actually if you're not doing heavy ions, but you are doing something like quantum chaos, the fact that fluctuations introduce thermalization is not so surprising. You have a very sort of you have a uh, you have a well tested conjecture called the Barry book called various names in various countries that basically says that high lying energy levels of states which are chaotic as QCD is in the strongly coupled regime, they look like thermal states. That somehow you have a quantum fluctuations and thermal fluctuations scramble to get quantum fluctuations and thermal fluctuations scramble together to introduce the appearance of thermalization. This is something that in other fields of physics is so fluctuations help you, or at least don't impede thermalization. This is something that is reasonably well known. What no one has done, I mean, this is sort of the density matrix of a, but this has always been done as the density as thermodynamics, not as hydrodynamics. Oh my God. Um, ah, I'm just pointing this in the, other dire in the wrong direction. That's why it doesn't work. Yeah, this is sort of done in a thermodynamic system. What we need is, what we need is assume this and assume this for every sort of fluid cell. We do not really know how to coarse grain this. And then ask, well, if the neighboring cells talk to each other, if the neighboring cells talk to each other, um, uh, we know that uh, thermodynamics emerges from this. What we do not know is if we coarse grain the system so that it emerge, so that this happens on the scale of like two particles or three particles. So you have a thermalized system of three particles, and why not? You know, dominated by phase space, and you make an event which is bigger with twenty particles. Will this event look like an ideal fluid? And what is the effective theory of hydrodynamics for this event? The Boltzmann equation doesn't work here because two particles is very far away from infinity. In ADS-CFT, the number of colors already kills you with it because then C is infinity. And by the way, in case you guys did not know, I mean, you don't even need a particle accelerator to talk about this problem. There is something called the Brazil nut effect. In Brazil, the biggest nut goes to the top, and no, that's not it. Thank God. Sometimes it's true, but <laughs> sometimes it's true, but thank God there are exceptions. Um, the Brazil nut effect is the is the fact that Brazil nut is what Portuguese speakers call castanha de para. If you have a container of many kinds of nuts in your kitchen, probably the biggest nut, which is usually the Castanha de Pará, is on top of this container. Believe it or not, this is something that physics groups in universities write PRLs about. The technical name is granular convection, and it's also called the Brazil nut effect. And essentially, the idea is that the idea is that it seems that. It seems that if you take a highly correlated system, like you know, a jar of nuts, that if you move one nut, you will move other ones, subjected to random motion, which in our case is simply you go to the supermarket, take a bag, and bring it home, and the bag gets shaken. Um, it seems that you get very close to hydrodynamic behavior. And the Brazil nut going to the top is the Archimedes principle. Um, the reason people write PRLs about this is that there is no statistical mechanics description of this. I mean, this is not the Boltzmann equation because you are very far from its sample average, whatever. And by the way, I mean, this is much more similar than, this is much more similar to a PA collision in heavy ions, to me at least, than a five-dimensional black hole in a theory with an infinite number of colors and four supersymmetries, because you know, very few degrees of freedom, but they're strongly interacting and they're subject to random fluctuations and approximate hydrodynamic behavior. So maybe it's the same thing. I mean, just so. So 
is there a way to is there a way to think about this which doesn't have to do with the usual systems of things like the Boltzmann equation, even the more recent incarnation of ads CFT, and is based intrinsically on fluctuations, and it's based intrinsically on fluctuations. Well, um, I'll, uh, yeah, I will be, as usual, I spend too much time on the introduction, but I will basically tell you the basics and I will tell you sort of the qualitative, the, the qualitative consequences of this. For every statistical theory, you need a state space and evolution dynamics. And there is actually a construction of hydrodynamics based entirely on dense on density matrices and where fluctuations are included, which is what is called the Zubara hydrodynamics. You basically take, what does that mean? You take a density matrix and you find a surface in space time, you find a foliation in space time where the system is in perfect equilibrium. If you find a foliation in space time where the system is perfect in equilibrium, you know what the density matrix is. It's going to be this from the KMS condition. And note that this is operatorial. Team you knew here is an operator. It includes quantum fluctuations, thermal fluctuations, whatever you want. This is an operator as well. And the time evolution of this operator, the time evolution of this operator is exact. I mean, this comes from this comes from basic quantum mechanics. And provided that you find a surface like this, um, you can provided that you find a surface like this, um, you've solved everything. Perfect hydrodynamics with all fluctuations, and it will be like this. The trouble is, of course, that usually things are not in perfect equilibrium. If you coarse grain this thing, you've you can rederive Kubot formulas this way, but this is a rederivation of things we found from other ways. So you're not you taking fluctuations out. And the problem is that, and the problem is that is that note that you have two vector frames here. You have the flow which is the queuing vector here. And you have the D sigma. If you have vorticity, these two guys cannot be parallel everywhere. This is just the Stokes theorem. So, however, that's okay because we can actually, I mean, you know, as we know from quantum field theory and the interaction picture and such and such, Splitting operators and splitting density matrices is actually possible, provided you're careful. Um, provided that, provided you, you're careful. And you can try to think about the fact that you can try to think that the system is split into the equilibrium part and an equilibrium part at the operator level, and the equilibrium part, and the equilibrium part is given by this matrix. Not just for averages, but for also all fluctuations. The question is, what do you what you need is dynamical equations of motion for this guy, which maintain the idea that the system is close enough to equilibrium. The fact that it's close to equilibrium now, it will be close to equilibrium always. It will be close to equilibrium in every time step. So you have to invent a microscopic dynamics for this guy, which includes fluctuations. It includes even temporary fluctuations from the second law of thermodynamics, but the system is in equilibrium, but the system is in equilibrium all the time. So the system is in equilibrium all the time. Um, and by the way, I mean, you know, if you look at this very nice review, the density matrix and the partition functions are sort of related. All this stuff makes sense if you're a quantum field theory. It can be connected to Schwinger Kaldish and then can work out. Um, so the question is, the question is, what do we do about this guy at the operator level? Well, on average, we know what this guy is. This guy is connected to the entropy. If you take the entropy projected on the flow gradient and uh, if you take this guy, the non-equilibrium part projected to the flow gradient and divide by temperature, you get the entropy current uh, along the normal of the D sigma foliation that we used. Um, so this guy here has something to do with the entropy operator. 
And it turns out, once again, um, you can try to rederive this from scratch, or you can go to other areas of physics. I mean, as I said, you know, um, fake thermalization, thermalization by quantum mechanics is something familiar from other areas of physics. The non-equilibrium dynamics for this operator here, it turns out is also familiar to the people who do pretty much the same, who do mesoscopic quantum thermodynamics. I mean, basically people who work on nanotechnology related theory and also things like the protein tropic problem. And there, there we already know something, we already know something, uh, a very, very nice relation called the Crookes fluctuation theorem. The Crookes fluctuation theorem says that it's a theorem um, proven for quantum systems which are in contact, but not necessarily in equilibrium with a thermal body. And also close to the Markovian limit. So in the limit where sort of memory, where uh, probabilities can be reduced to sort of classical probabilities rather than quantum entanglement type things. You can make a, you can make a real function. You don't need quantum interference. And what it says, it's simply, if you have a system connected to the thermal bath, it's a mesoscopic system. Usually um, this system extracts work from the bath. It increases the entropy. But sometimes because of the thermal fluctuation, the opposite happens. The bath doesn't work for the system and the entropy decreases. The ratio between these two cases is the exponent of the entropy change of this work. If you learn statistical mechanics from like Boltzmann at all, you'll be like, wait, this is a theorem. And this Krug's guy is a guy who is still a working physicist rather than a guy who died a hundred years ago. This is obvious, right? Entropy is the number of microstates. But it's actually not obvious at all. And this is why it was done now. I mean, sometimes this is called, a limit of this is called, another version of this is called the Jarzinski equality. And Jarzinski is not even that old. I mean, yeah, the reason, the reason is that it's valid very far from equilibrium and your, the entropy is sort of introduced in, from, the, uh, from the von Neumann description rather than from the, from the von Neumann description rather than from the number of microstates. And as I said, it's proven in a certain way. So it's, it's a non-equilibrium version of entropy when we know work. Usually we, in hydrodynamics, we know what work is, but quantifying the entropy current from possible non-equilibrium terms, it's a difficult thing. So here is the reverse. Um, and what is nice is that this way you can, you, the, the, when, you, when you take this, when you take this theorem, and here, here is a very nice paper about this stuff, it allows you to do exactly what I wanted to do. It allows you to uh, split the density matrix and describe the dynamics of, uh, of the non-equilibrium piece in, in, at the level of operators. And if you take infinite limits, if you take infinite limits of this, you actually get the Kubo formulas that we know and love. So we get the side check. Um, of course, this is not, this has never been proven for quantum field theories, and I'm not smart enough to prove it for quantum field theories. But one thing that, I'm, that, that is very simple, and I could do it, is let's assume that it also holds true for quantum field theories, because why not? It holds true for systems with countable numbers of degrees of freedom. So we put quantum field theory in a box and take the limit, and hopefully nothing bad happens to the limit. Um, these, these, these guys sort of diverge, but the ratio parameter doesn't diverge. So, so it's good. Um, and then hydrodynamics work is obvious. Work is an absolutely obvious thing. It's the projection, it's the projection of the energy momentum operator along our foliation axis. So the dynamics for the non-equilibrium current which reproduces closeness to equilibrium for all times is simply assuming, assuming the Crookes fluctuation theorem holds and using it to 
propagate and using it to propagate the system from one time step to the other. It's sort of similar to constructing Wilson loops and Wilson lines and Wilson loops in QC. Um, instead of Wilson lines, you have these work terms. You take the exponential of them, then you define you define the entropy current as the ratio of these two guys here. And this way, step by step, if someone sort of has a lattice, lattice Monte Carlo, you can use the Metropolis algorithm because these are classical probabilities. If you have a lattice Monte uh, 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 enough computing time to build an ensemble of states for every time step, you can involve this pioneer new step by step, and you can build a hydrodynamic ensemble which looks like equilibrium and includes all the fluctuations. Um, uh, I do not have a computer. I do not have such a computer, and I'm also not an analyst QCD theorist. But I can tell you that this reproduces exactly all of the all of the things that we know, both in statistical mechanics and in hydrodynamics. So if we take a space-like foliation, we reproduce Boltzmann's entropy is the log of the number of microstates. If we take the space-like contour and we tilt it a little bit, we reproduce Kubo's forecast. And if we take the limit of an infinite number of degrees of freedom and small viscosity, so fluctuations go to zero and viscosity goes to zero, we reproduce Delta functions and the evolution of these delta, we, the function, our functional becomes a delta function, and uh, uh, it, it becomes a delta function, or in other words, a function. And the equation, the differential equation for this function is entropy conservation, which is one of the formulations of ideal hydrodynamics. So at least it's sort of a good proposal of a of a definition of hydrodynamics, which is sort of non-perturbative and includes fluctuations from the beginning. Okay. Um, in summary, all known limits are reproduced, all fluctuations are included. If you're numerically, if you're numerically um, inclined, I urge you to put this on the lattice and see if one can make something that makes sense out of this. Um, but the question is, can, can this picture of hydrodynamics give us a way that fluctuations can help thermalize? Like, is there a qualitative, is there a qualitative thing that this, that this picture, is there a qualitative thing, the thing that this picture can say about thermalization helped by fluctuations? And it actually turns out there is. And it is related to something which is, really obvious if you think about this, but is missed usually in all of the literature of relativistic hydrodynamics up to date. I certainly missed it for many years and I'm in this business for a long time, which is this. Like, as I said in the beginning, as I said in the beginning, um, the, the hydrodynamics is based around separating the energy momentum tensor on average from an equilibrium and an equilibrium part. Very good. But the separation is something that is done entirely in the theorist's head. Because neither this guy nor this guy are observable. Which really should worry you. Because this guy, in, you, in the usual approach that I described earlier, this guy and this guy have very different dynamics. This guy here is basically built out of built out of flow, temperature, and pressure that you get from equilibrium partition functions. Flow you get from initial conditions. This guy here is something that has a relaxation of type dynamics. But again, the experimentalists have never measured these guys. It can only measure a combination. Also, we've used Kubo's formulas. Also, we've used Kubo's formulas. Um, and in, in the Kubo limit, these two guys can be, these two guys can be, can indeed be separated because in the Kubo limit, you take the infrared limit and fluctuations in the infrared go to zero. So a fluctuation between this guy and this guy will not happen in the infrared. 
But when you do that, you are assuming that the hydrodynamic scale, you're already making the assumption that the Boltzmann equation is the right one because you're assuming that the hydrodynamic scale is large enough that the fluctuation scale is irrelevant, that any sound waves uh, seeded by fluctuations dissipate. Data says you cannot assume this. And experimentally, there is simply no way to disentangle these two guys. So in the Zubarev picture, this guy here is a foliation. And I said that it's generally different from beta mu. It's generally different from flow. But I didn't say anything about what is it. In fact, it's completely arbitrary. It just has to be close enough to equilibrium, whatever that means. And changing this guy is exactly a change in these two guys here. And this guy here is certainly something that the theorist who solves hydrodynamics invents. I mean, you know, it's something that the computer program invents. And in this sense, this is actually, and in this sense, this is actually an analogy to gauge theory. So you are saying that if you change the, uh -huh. the way you separate between the, equilibrium and fluctuations, what you call what? You change the physics or you don't change the physics? Well, usually in hydrodynamics, you change the, the physics. physics. Yeah, that's what. And I'm saying this is a problem of hydrodynamics. Okay. If you're building an effective theory of hydrodynamics and fluctuations, you need to make sure, you need to make sure that you, uh, that you don't change the physics. Mm -hmm. And this actually goes to the heart of something that has been discussed in the literature recently. As I said, that there was the development of relativistic hydrodynamics kind of stopped in the 70s, kind of stopped in the 70s. And what people mostly agreed with is something called Israel Stewart. Where, why? I mean, Navier-Stokes equations are inherently non-causal um, because the relativistic diffusion uh, doesn't have a speed limit. It can go to arbitrary speeds. So you need to invent a way to make sure that diffusion proceeds in a causal way. And what most people have done since the 70s is treating this pi mu nu using relaxational dynamics. So this pi mu nu is arbitrary degrees of freedom, but they relax to the something like the expectation value of matter state. And this is what is usually called Israel Stewart hydrodynamics. Recently, um, this is something that people have done before, but the, the basic idea was, well, you don't have to do this because this is actually numerically very exacting because then you need um, an energy momentum tensor. Then you basically, this guy here is an arbitrary symmetric four by four matrix. So it has something like 10 degrees of freedom and you need 10 equations of motion for this. 10 couple differential equations, and this is not very stable. Um, instead, what people, what people have done, uh, so, so people do this, but they don't like it. And they sort of would like to have a way out of this. And one way out of this, which was invented recently, is to recover P menu being a gradient at the price that this guy here is not a killing vector. It has nothing to do with isotropic pressure. But it's simply a vector frame that obeys certain causality conditions that people just you know, pull out of the air from the initial conditions. So either you have u mu as a killing vector or you have phi mu nu being a function of the gradients. And when I first heard about this, I was like, yeah, but this is nonsense, come on. I mean, this is a mathematical trick. And the reason for this is that if you care for statistical mechanics, if you, statistical mechanics is based around the ergodic hypothesis of Poincare cycles. So time, time averaging is the same thing as microstate average. In a relativistic theory, this is a frame dependent statement because time averaging has a time frame. And the right frame to do this is the frame closest to equilibrium, which defines u mu. Here, u mu is arbitrary, so you've broken. So you, so you, here u mu is ar arbitrary, so you've broken, you've broken the ergodic hypothesis. So what's going on? However, um, 
what I was saying about if you have fluctuations and you have deviations from the H theorem because of fluctuations, it might be possible to consider these two guys not as different theories, because this is what uh, these guys here are like, well, perhaps the right effective theory is this guy here. And other people say, well, perhaps the right effective theory is this guy here. What I would claim is that these two guys are different gauges. They're not different theories. A theory with fluctuations should be reproduced by these two guys. In the same way that in gauge theory, I mean, the physics is, um, the functional integral is over potentials, but the Lagrangian depends not on potentials, but on a particular combination of potential, which leaves a redundancy. Here in Zubarev, the action is actually a contraction with the energy momentum tensor in beta. And the functional integral is still in terms of microscopic fields. So the redundancy in the definition of U is similar to gauge theory. And one might be able, in a theory that includes fluctuations, one might be able to consider these guys as gauges. What exactly does this mean? And how is this realized? And how is this realized in, uh, in a theory with fluctuations? Well, if you have approximate equilibrium, if you have approximate equilibrium, um, you might have fluctuations, but you should have a fluctuation dissipation theorem. So locally, you will have, so locally, you, will, you might have a fluctuation or you might have a dissipative evolution, and you should not be able to tell which is it, which in a local manner, in a manner related to the coarse grain. In terms of the Poincare trajectory, what this means is that if you take every cell, if you take every cell, your system is, so they are going through the Poincare cycle very fast compared to the gradient. Every site, every state is reached an, e an approximately equal number of times. And furthermore, you do not know if deviations from this, I said approximately, you do not know if deviations from this are due to a breakdown in equilibrium or I do so a momentum fluctuation, not an energy fluctuation, but a momentum fluctuation that makes you think that the frame, maybe the system is slightly away from equilibrium. Maybe the system is in equilibrium, but you've just chosen a different frame and the imperfect Poincare cycle is due to relativity of simultaneity. You've chosen the wrong clock. Choosing a frame is like choosing a clock and you've chosen the wrong clock with, with which to clock your, your cycle. Um, if the fluctuation dissipation theorem holds, these two should give you exactly the same physics. These two assumptions should give you exactly the same physics. And in Zubarev, this is exactly what happens. And in Zubarev, this is exactly what happens. And this is the physical meaning of the gauge theory. The evolution, because of the fact that evolution is also given by the Cook's fluctuation theorem that is based on counting microstates, there is no way of distinguishing equilibrium uh, there is no way from distinguishing an equilibrium fluctuation from an equilibrium evolution. And what you knew it, different choices of sigma nu will give you a different way to define the flow. Um, I do not have I do not have that much time. In fact, I have very little time. So I will just go to the end. I mean, this can be made quantitative. I will just tell you that this can be made quantitative. All you have to do, I mean, you know, this conceptually is complicated, but mathematically it's sort of simple, because all you do is you perform a non-inertial transformation. You perform a non-inertial transformation, basically, and a, a, gener a non-inertial general co combination of generators of the Lorentz group on every cell. And then you calculate the probability of the system being in equilibrium at that cell. So you deviate from equilibrium, you calculate the probability of the system being in equilibrium, but in the cell, not given by your previous frame, but given from with the non-inertial transformation that you did. Um, this probability usually goes to zero if you have an infinite number of particles, because there is this product here and there's going to be this exponential here. 
And if it's less than one, then this product is, all, is going to zero if there is an infinite number of particles. But if there is a finite number of particles, there is many ways around equilibrium to build something like this. So these redundancies are really going to dominate your partition function. And this is sort of the meat of the matter. Because as you reduce the number of particles, you increase the number of fluctuations, you increase the number of possible fluctuations. In every fluctuation, your pi mean year will be a different thing. In every fluctuation, your pi mean year will be a different thing, and your flow is going to be a different thing. Even your Boltzmann entropy is going to be different, but the Gibbsian entropy will be the same because the Gibbsian entropy is constructed with a partition function like this. Um, the generators are basically the generators of the Lorentz group. Some will give you shear channels and some will give you both channels. And what you're doing is that in one frame, you will have a fluctuation generating a sound wave. In another frame, you will have a dissipative current that decays. But the dynamics will be invariant. But the dynamics will be invariant. And also, and also Lorentz covariance gives you a word identity for the correlator, which is usually called the gravitational word identity. Um, there is a way to characterize this in terms of effective theory in terms of effective field theory and to construct approximately conserved currents, which are energy momentum currents given by a combination of fluctuation and advective current. The final thing that I will tell, the final thing is qualitatively, how could this help small systems thermalize? Well, think about this attractor picture Think about, think about this event averaging, but instead of thinking about an ensemble of initial conditions and an ensemble of final conditions and evolution, this helps you, you do the frequentist to Bayesian sort of transformation and think about event by event, you have an initial condition, you have a point in phase space as an initial condition, you have a point in phase space as a final condition, and you have a multitude of paths, each including fluctuation and dissipation that goes from one to the other. And each path has a probability assigned to it. When fluctuations go to zero, this redundancy of paths becomes infinitely narrow, but for a small system, you really have a lot of paths. And each of these paths will give you the same evolution. Our codes, our numerical codes, are sort of biased towards ideal hydro because they break down with the viscosity is too big. And the point is, I mean, we, we know what the initial conditions are. They're basically Glover and color class. And we know what the final conditions are. They're our output of our Monte Carlo. The point is that the probability of having an evolution that approaches the evolution of ideal hydrodynamics for smaller systems goes up even if viscosity is big. And because of this, I mean, I would consider this an inverse attractor because you're not taking the ensemble of initial and final conditions, you're taking the ensemble of trajectories. It should be, there's the probability of finding a trajectory where, which reproduces both the data in initial conditions and looks like ideal hydrodynamics is big. And our models kind of concentrate on this in the sense that if we find something that fits the data, we say that this is it. And usually what we find that fits the data is the thing with the smaller viscosity. So if we think, so the point is if we, if we include fluctuations in these models, if we include fluctuations in these models, what we should find is that the probability of finding an evolution that looks like ideal hydrodynamics doesn't go, goes up as the number of constituents goes down. And this might be, and this might be the reason why systems with strong, which are strongly correlated, um, but fluctuating, um, but fluctuating um, look like ideal hydrodynamics. You don't just have fluctuations in energy, you have fluctuations in energy and momentum, Fluctuations in energy and momentum give you multiple definitions of flow, and the multiple definitions of flow increase the probability that something that looks like ideal hydrodynamics flow 
also the strength of the data. And um, one might be able to one might be able to do this with transport if one promotes a fun, the function the distribution function to a functional, but I will not talk about this also because this is work in progress. And I will just go to the conclusion to ask you if you if you want to find out about this, ask me a question. And um, as soon as as soon as we end, I will just watch my conclusion. My conclusion is that we still do not know why systems of a few particles thermalize, but they seem to be. And we need an effective description of those fluctuations that maybe these gauge theory type picture might be able to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio, for this very nice seminars.